Good morning, church. Good morning. Today, Pastor Peter will be preaching the message from Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. I am Hugin Skie. I will read in Haitian Creole. And I'm Brianna Guillet, and I will read in English. Hear the word of the, of the Lord. Lord. Laissa Pierre approcher pour côté Jésus, lui dit le coup ça, mais combien de fois pour pardonner Frem, le lui faire un bagage mal. Cette fois, coup ça, Jésus répond lui non, Pierre. Moi, je ne vais pas dire que je pardonne cette fois, mais je pardonne 70 fois cette fois. Mais qui j'en ça a passé dans le pays où il y a ciel là, c'est tant qu'il y a un pays qui voulait faire un règlement avec le domestique Lyon. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Pour yo van li tonku esclave, li même madame li petit li yo a som a tout sal li te gen pour yo pay debt la. The music la tombe a genou devant met la li di li me tonpu y souple. Pour yo ti passion pour moi, ma pay yo tout la joie. As he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Li contre a un camarade qui de duel sans gold. Li kembel, li pran, li tangel, li dili paye son ou dwe mwen la. Camarade la di la ge kor la terre, li di lot la. Tan pui, pon yon ti passion pou mwen, mwen paye ou. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. Mais l'autre n'a pas attendu. Il fait mettre le camarade dans la prison pour que lui fait fin payer le salaire de l'autre. Le l'autre n'a domestique où ça a été arrivé, c'est de faire mal, faire mal en prison. Ya le conte met la sa te passer. Le sa met la faire relay domestique là, li dit comme ça, garde Jean ou méchant. Moi quitter toute ma toute l'argent ça pour parce que ou te mandem pour faire ça pour. But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. You have to pity for your friends, but I have to pity for you. But I have to do a lot. I have to put the man in prison for your battle. I have to pay for all your debt. It's like that, Papa. Kin awon asiela va agi ak nou. Si nou pa paden ne fwe nou, yo ka ak yo ak tu nou ak tu ke nou. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is this the word, word of, of the Lord. Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, we are starting a new sermon series as of last week, and it's called Deeper Together. 
And what we're doing is we're looking at the idea of how do we build deeper relationships in Christ? Because the, the focus in the next couple of months is just going to be on relationships and how we can build relationships. A lot of the activities that we're doing are all about making space for us to get to know each other better. So the Mariners on June 30th, right, that's a great opportunity for us to cheer on a winning team. We'd cheer for them when they were, weren't winning, right? Yeah. Mariners fans, you know that. That's usually the case. Um, we want to encourage you to get out there and to just spend time with each other. The other thing is our all-church retreat, which is happening in July, which is really focused on telling each other stories and hearing each other's stories. Um, please don't let finances get in your way. If finances are any kind of problem, just let us know. You know, there are some people in our church who can't go because of scheduling, but they are actually paying to go anyway so that someone else can go in their stead. Right? So don't worry about it. People are here for you, and so if there's any kind of barriers, please sign up right away, and we will make it possible for you to go. So a lot of activities in that way. Um, but it's not just about hanging out. As great as it is for us to hang out with each other, the real point is to look at how we can build relationships in Christ, deeper relationships in Christ, right? Because the fact that we're Christians should change our relationships, shouldn't it? Our relationships should look differently because we follow after Jesus. And so that's really the kind of the heart of what we're looking at. It's not just building deep relationships, but what does the fact that we follow after Jesus, how does that change our relationships with our kids or with our neighbors or all the people around us? We started this last week, and what we were looking at, we said that, you know, relationships are so important that, in fact, loneliness can have a physical impact on us. We can be sick physically because of loneliness. And, in fact, loneliness is equivalent to smoking one pack of cigarettes a day. That's the impact that loneliness can have on us. But we also said that there are a lot of things that stand in the way of relationships, that relationships aren't easy and they often kind of split us apart. That's what we talked about last week. Um, Today, what I wanted to do is I wanted to start with a quote that comes from an oncologist, uh, the doctor who deals with cancer patients and also a writer. And he gave a speech uh, for uh, graduates in college And this is what he said in his speech. It's from Dr. Sahartra Mukherjee, and he says this. Every person I've met in this moment of transition where they are passing away wanted to make four offerings. And so they say one of four things in those moments and, you know, different variations of those four things. And the first two things that he often hears when people are um, passing away is this. I want to tell you that I love you. And then secondly, would you tell me that you love me? And that just makes sense. These are the last moments that we have. And so we want to tell people, I love you. And we want to hear that as well. And so I think that is very natural for us to hear in that moment. But the second two phrases that Dr. Mukherjee identified are maybe a little surprising, maybe not. But the other two things that people say on their deathbed are this. I want to tell you that I forgive you. Or would you give me your forgiveness? Yeah. Right? In that last moment that people have, that's what they need to be able to say to someone. That they forgive someone for what they've done or else they are asking forgiveness for something that they have done instead. And I think the, the fact that this comes out in that moment, in this kind of last moment of a person's life, highlights a couple of things. I think first it highlights how important forgiveness is to relationships. You have this one moment and you have a couple of breaths to say something to someone and you say something about love and then the next breath, forgiveness. Clearly, forgiveness is really key to relationships. But I think the other thing that this kind of this um, example highlights to us is how hard forgiveness is. That many of us would wait to the very last moment that we have to say this. Because it's so difficult to say. And we have to understand that, that Dr. Mukherjee is just hearing the people who have said this. There are probably people who didn't even say it. Whether they didn't get the chance or it was still too hard to say. And that maybe they even passed away before they were able to say these things. Right? Forgiveness really sits at the heart of relationships. And I think what this really highlights to us is a difficult fact that I think we need to deal with. And that's this. Relationships are all but impossible where there is a lack of forgiveness. When we can't forgive someone or someone can't forgive us. This is not, I think, a, um, 
a profound insight. I just think it's something that we all know is true. When you know someone has something against you or you know you have something against them, you can't really have a relationship. You can have a working relationship. You can have that kind of like, hey, how's it going kind of thing that's going on. But you know you can't really have a relationship because there's always that gulf. There's always that thing that will always stand between you and this person. We know this. We know that the nearly impassable boundary for us when it comes to having a real relationship with someone is hurt, whether we have been hurt or we have hurt someone else. And so as we're talking about relationship and we're talking about, hey, let's have deeper relationships with each other, the elephant in the room is forgiveness. Can we forgive each other? And can we ask for forgiveness from each other? Because if we can't do that, this whole relationship thing is almost out of the question. We really have to deal with this. When it comes to thinking about relationships in Christ, there is a, a really central teaching that Jesus gives when it comes to relationships and forgiveness. And that's a parable of the, un- parable of the unforgiving servant. The parable of the unforgiving servant. And it was read this morning, and many of us know this parable, is when this servant has a debt of thousands and millions of dollars, and the, the master forgives it. And he says, it's fine, forgives it, and so he goes about his way. But in the very next moment, he turns to someone who owns him just a few dollars and he gets mad and shakes him down and throws this guy in prison for just a few bucks. And of course, people who witness this are outraged and so that first servant is punished as a result, right? Many of us know this passage. We're we're comfortable with this or we've heard this before. And it's a very, you know, uh, very powerful teaching on forgiveness, how it doesn't make sense for us not to forgive people when we've been forgiven of so much, right? And we've all heard this before. But one thing, whenever I read this parable, that always kind of sits with me is, it doesn't feel very realistic, does it? It's very powerful in its teaching, but can you imagine anyone who would really do that? who is forgiven, let's say, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, and as soon as they walk out of that bank or whatever, they see someone who owes them for lunch and then like starts, you know, like shaking them down for that money. Can you imagine that happening? Can you imagine yourself doing that? No, no, of course we would never do that, right? Or can you imagine anyone else? Right? It's not a believable kind of thing. It's not realistic. And because it's not believable or realistic, we can't really see ourselves doing that. It doesn't really, the application is very difficult because how can I apply it when I never do this stuff? And I can't really imagine it happening. And that I think is the one thing about this passage that I always struggle with is how could someone ever do that? How could it be believable for someone to do that? So I've thought about this and I've tried to think about when could this ever happen? When could someone be that blind to how much they've been forgiven? And for me, there's really only one answer that I can think of, and that's forgetfulness, if they're forgetful. Let me take you just kind of, of for example. Let's say this person, this first servant, has short-term memory loss, real short-term memory loss, right? Something's just kind of, they have a lesion, right, in in their brain. And so they've been forgiven this money, like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, but they literally forget, They literally, it just goes out of their mind. And then they go out of the bank, and then they see this guy who owes them lunch. And they're like, that guy owes me lunch. Hey, you owe me lunch. And then that would kind of make sense. I could believe that if they have short-term memory loss. I could be like, okay, I understand that situation. Let's say it's 20 years apart. In the passage, actually happens back to back. But let's say it's two decades from one moment to the other. In two decades, we can forget a lot of things, can't we? I forget like what I ate for breakfast this morning. So I, could, I could easily forget something over 20 years. So let's say it's been 20 years since this man was forgiven this enormous debt. He's 20 years older, maybe lives in a different part of the country, and then he sees this person who owes him, let's say, $100, and says, hey, I remember that guy. His face made me think about this. He owes me money, and I still feel bad about that. Right? You could believe that. This passage is believable. It's applicable if there is forgetfulness, if someone forgets something. And I think this is one of the most important things about forgiveness, is I think one of the most realistic reasons why we, why we don't forgive people or why we don't ask for forgiveness is because of forgetfulness. We're forgetting something. Yeah. And so the question is, practically, what are we forgetting? 
Why, why is forgiveness so hard for us? What are we forgetting that would make it so difficult for us to do? I think there are a lot of things, but I think one thing I want to talk about in particular, which is this. Perhaps we have a hard time with forgiveness because of forgetfulness that we forget we are a forgiveness people. We are a forgiveness people. Let me just kind of explain what I mean by a people because that word can mean a lot of different things. There is one definition of the word people, which is a group of human beings. People waiting outside of the line of a bathroom, that's people, right? Those are people waiting for the bathroom. But that doesn't make them a people. That's not your people. <laughs> your people are not pe people waiting outside for the bathroom, right? There's something different about your people. These are my people. This is a people. When we talk about people like that, this is, this is people who do the same thing. We feel the same way. We have the same instincts about things. In Webster's Dictionary, it says, people, a people, is a group that is united by common culture, tradition, practices, or a sense of kinship. That's what a people do. This is, this is my people, and this is what we do all the time. For me, I'm Korean, and so my people are Koreans. We, we do certain things. It's just kind of what we do. We fight each other for the bill at a restaurant. Literally, we'll come to blows. To, not so the other person will get it. So I get it. So I have to pay. I have seen parents or people in my parents' generation like get into arguments about paying the bills, like physically pushing each other out of the way. They're tricking each other and they'll come into the like restaurant and they'll like slip their credit card to the, to the waiter before they order anything. You know, and the, you know, that's just what happens. That's what my people do. There's another thing that, you know, Derek was talking about where in Korean churches, this is the idea of early morning prayer, sebekido, where basically the entire church goes to prayer at 4.30 in the morning and it's packed out. It's just like a Sunday service. And that's just what you do. If you're at a Korean church, you will go to early morning prayer. No one likes it. I don't think they like it, but they just go. That's what our people do right? And there's this idea that when you're part of a people, there are things that you do because that's who you are. It's your identity. It's kind of just, you know, you, there's not a conscious decision that you make to do it. It's because of who you are, yeah. right? And for those of us who have a people or feel like we're part of people, you know, it's just what our people do. It's kind of, even this morning I was walking outside to the bathroom and I saw an older Korean person around my age and immediately I, I bowed down because that's just what I do. I don't even think about it. It's just kind of what our people do, right? So who are we as Christians? Who are our people? What does it mean to be a Christian people? Who, what is our people and what are our traditions? What are our cultures? Who makes us? What makes us who we are? What forges us, right? And I would offer to us what forges us maybe more than anything else is forgiveness. Everything that we are has something to do with forgiveness from the very beginning. For example, we are a people who all need forgiveness at some point in time. Romans 3 says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Every single one of us, you know what, what makes us all similar? It's not race. It's not gender. It's not political persuasion. It's that we're all messed up. Every single person here. Nobody's perfect here. Whether it's yesterday you needed forgiveness or today you need forgiveness or tomorrow you're going to need forgiveness, we're all on the same boat. Every single person here. That's, that's what makes us a people, is that we need forgiveness. We're also a people freely forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. Acts 13 says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. You know why all of us are here? Because we're forgiven. That's it. We're not here because we're great people. We're not here because this building is here, or because we went to membership class. We're here just because of forgiveness, because we're forgiven people. It's the only reason why we're Christians. It's because, not because of our goodness, but God said, I love you so much, I will forgive you through my son's sacrifice. Every single one of us are here because of forgiveness, because we needed it, and because we received it. We're also a people who are commanded to forgive one another. We're told in Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. All of us here are commanded to forgive. 
There's not one of us in this room where Jesus says, you're okay, don't worry. (laughs) Everyone else, you need to forgive, but I don't expect it from you. No, every single person in this room, Jesus gave a blanket command, whether in Matthew 8 or Matthew 18 or on the Lord's Prayer or in Ephesians chapter 4, you're all supposed to be forgiving other people. You're all supposed to be forgiving other people. And that's what we have to understand about the Christian identity. Forgiveness for us is not just an idea or a concept. It's not a choice. It is who we are. It is our very identity. You cannot remove forgiveness from the identity of being a Christian. Forgiveness sits at the very heart of everything we are. We need it. We have received it freely, and we are commanded to give to other people. We are a forgiveness people. That's if we want to kind of figure out who are we as a people. We're forgiveness people. Forgiveness is woven into every part of our story from the beginning and to the end. We are formed from forgiveness and we are forged to forgive. This is who we are. This is who we are. And I think maybe this is what we need to remember so that forgiveness is not so difficult and we forget it so easily. Forgiveness is hard. But I think it helps to remember our identity as a forgiveness people. As a forgiveness people. To remember that. That's just who we are. Every single one of us, if we're Christians, we are forgiveness people. And we may not like forgiving people. Who does like forgiving people? We may not like asking for forgiveness, but it's just what our people have done. It's just what our Lord has commanded. It's the reason why we're here. And if we don't like it, it's still, this is who we are as a people. This is our identity. Maybe we just need to remember our identity as a forgiveness people. That we can't take forgiveness out of who we are as Christians. What I think we need to do, and like we saw in that definition of a people, is that a people doesn't just, you know, aren't, aren't just unified by the common ideas. It's also culture. We need culture that bonds us together as well. And so every people needs a culture, and so forgiveness people need a forgiveness culture. It's really not enough for us just to say, oh, we all believe in forgiveness here, we all believe in Jesus, and so we should be forgiving. We already know that. Every single one of us, I mean, if you didn't, this is a good day for you to to know something really fundamental. For the rest of us, you probably already knew this, right? What we lack more than anything is the culture of forgiveness is a normalization of forgiveness where we know the words of forgiveness. We have the history and the tradition of forgiveness and we just kind of can do this because it's part of what our people do and it's an instinct for us. And that, I think, is what we really need to establish is examples of forgiveness, using the words of forgiveness, thinking about the teachings of forgiveness and those kind of things. So it becomes a culture for us instead. And I wanted to give an example of this practically, just of how we can use kind of moments and words and teachings and and opportunities to kind of just make it a normal thing for us. And it's something that happened last week. Some of you might have been here, but if those who weren't, I think it's a good example of just making forgiveness a normal, practical thing for our culture. Uh, last week, we had our friends from Mending Wings here from the Yakima Reservation. And they came to share and came to uh, tell us about some of the amazing program they were having for their youth on the reservation. And it was a great time. And uh, they were here also to pick up a, a present that we had for them. But as I was preaching, um, I said something kind of stupid. And you understand, I say a lot of things during a sermon. It is very hard to make sure none of them are stupid. Okay, and I do this week after week. It's not easy to not say dumb things off the, you know, off when you're trying to say a lot of stuff. And so as they're sitting there, there was a moment where I was trying to just make an example of something. And I said, you know, it's not very important to us. It's very low on the toe. And I stopped right there. And you can probably guess what I was trying to say. I was trying to say it's very low on the totem pole. But I caught myself in that moment. And I, I said, I stopped and I just kind of went on. Right, caught myself, went on. As I was preaching, I felt heat kind of bubbling up from my neck. I don't know if you ever feel that when you're like, something's not right here. Something's not right. And I'm, I, what, what happened was, I, I thought about, I'm giving this sermon. I'm like on an altar 
giving an offering. Do you remember that one time when Jesus says something, if you have an offering, you're going to give in an altar? You remember what he says? You know our tradition, our words are? He says, put that offering down, make it right, and then come back. That's our culture. That's what our, our leader, our Lord, told us to do. So that, that was the Holy Spirit burning me up from the inside. And I said, okay, that, that's, that's what our people do. Our people would do that. And so I had to stop and I said, okay, I can't, I can't bring this offering. I got to say, that was wrong. That was really insensitive. I'm, you know, I'm sorry for doing that. And then Corey and Dewey just kind of smiled and nodded, you know, the guy's forgiveness. And so, you know, we were okay. And I was able to, I could feel the heat kind of receding. And then I, I went ahead with the sermon afterwards. And I felt much freer afterwards, much freer in that moment. Yeah. Afterwards, I talked to Corey and he told me a couple of things. First off, he told me, number one, he said that um, Yakima people don't use totem poles, right? So he was like, uh, it really wasn't a big deal to me. But he also said, well, you, you know, he knows people in, in cultures that do. And he said, you know, in a totem pole, the lowest one is actually the, the core family. That's the foundation. And I'm like, so we don't even have our stereotypes right, is what you're telling me. <laughs> We, we don't even know, like, the wrong thing. Like, we say the wrong things completely, right? And we were laughing about it. But he also told me a story of one time when he was in Bible college, and he said something really offensive to someone, and someone freely forgave him. And so he was like, why would I not forgive you? Yeah. And we're just passing it along. We're just normalizing it. Like, oh, let's just pass it along. As I receive it, I'm going to give it. And as you give it, I'm going to receive it. And it's just becoming normal. And then we had lunch. We had a great time laughing and taking pictures and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, we're trying to plan other times to get together. This should be, this should be how we speak. Forgiveness for us, for our people, for people that we know, all of us are screw-ups. And all of us sit in the light of the cross, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And all of us have been commanded to do this. Giving forgiveness and asking forgiveness should not be deathbed confessions. It should not be something that we can only do in the very last moments of our life. We have been given permission by the grace of Jesus Christ to do this freely with one another, to be freed from these burdens for decades instead of carrying it across cultures and oceans to the very ends of our lives, to be relieved of it instead. This is what our people do. And God gives us his gifts so we can be freed from these things. What I think sometimes makes it the silliest thing makes it hard for us is just saying the words. Just saying the words, will you forgive me or I forgive you. Even as you think about it, it just feels weird in your mouth because it's so weighty. And so what I want to do in, in this effort of normalizing forgiveness in this forgiveness place, in this place built in the shadow of the cross, is I just want to say it. I just want to be able to say these things. And for right now, you're not even saying it to anybody. You're just saying the words so that our lips get in this habit of forming these words so that when we do have to say it, we'll feel comfortable having it come out of our mouths. And so I just want to have to say these two phrases, the ones that Dr. Mukherjee said that so often we wait to the very end. And maybe we don't get to choose our ends. There's no guarantee that we will choose and get to say this. And this is a moment for us to speak those words so that we can say them when we have to. But I want us to say these so that we can say them before we have to and in the moments that we're free to. So the first thing I want us to say together, and again, don't look at anybody. <laughs> that might make it harder, right? Just look straight ahead, right? Locked forward. And I just want to say this first phrase. I want to tell you I forgive you. Can we all say this together? I want to tell you I forgive you. And just say that one more time so it's so natural for us as a forgiveness people. I want to tell you, I forgive you. Now, think about a face. Let's say the second phrase together, which is, I want to ask, would you forgive me? Okay, let's say this together. I want to ask, would you forgive me? And one more time, I want to ask, would you forgive me? 
Worship team, why don't you come up and the rest of us, let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer and reflection. This is, this is a hard one. This is not easy because it won't take much imagining, much remembering for us to think about someone who we can't forgive or someone who we have not asked for forgiveness from. And we also know the truth that our relationship is just not right as a result of it, God. And we know it's right there. But we also want to remember, God, that we are a forgiveness people. Everything that we are as Christians comes out of forgiveness. And that we pray that we remember this is who we are. Everything that we are as Christians has something to do with the idea of forgiveness. This is just what our people do. So God, I pray that you would help us, help us to forgive and to ask forgiveness. We don't have to do it publicly. We don't have to come in front of 20, 30, 40, 50 people. In fact, you tell us not to, not to trumpet our good deeds in front of others. But God, help us, help us to be the people of forgiveness that we're called to be. God, I pray for each of us that forgiveness would not be a deathbed confession. It would not be something that we hold on to and our relationships are hurting as a result of it. Help it to be natural. Help it to be natural for us to say, I'm sorry to our children. Help, it, help us to be natural to say, I messed up to our coworkers. Help us to make it natural, God, for us to say, would you forgive me to our spouses, yes. to all the people around us, God, because that's who we are. Help us to remember that we are a forgiveness people. That is who we are. God, we pray. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.